Okay, um, welcome back to C Sharp application development. Um, so we've made a little bit of a right-hand turn um, in the semester. So instead of um, trying to go through Xamarin um, in a couple of videos um, and kind of punting on uh, some of the complexities of inter um, entity framework and persistence and all that kind of stuff, what we're going to do um, is we're going to go through a couple more uh, state stages of persistence. So in this video, we're going to talk about entity framework and uh, in, in a little bit of, de of detail, um, hopefully not too much. And in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, MongoDB um, as a kind of alternative for people who don't necessarily have access to Windows, a Windows machine. Um, SQL Server is, uh, it either runs on Linux or um, uh, Windows. It does not run on Mac, to my knowledge. Um, so if, unless you have a very, very, very powerful Mac um, and you can run SQL Server on Bootcamp, uh, it's going to be pretty hard for you to run a full instance um, and you're going to need an alternative. And so we're going to talk about MongoDB um, as that alternative next video. So um, I had attempted to record this video no fewer than five times. Um, and each time I have fallen into explaining uh, things in a sort of gratuitous level of detail that I think um, you're probably just going to roll your eyes uh, and ignore. Um, so uh, what I'm going to endeavor to do is provide enough detail that it kind of makes sense and you understand how all of it hangs together. And then if you have specific questions about anything that's happening in the video, if you feel like you need uh, more complicated stuff to happen um, for your project that you want to work on, um, please let me know and I'm happy to help you um, through whatever sort of advanced kind of entity framework stuff you want to talk about. Um, but uh, for the purposes of just sort of an overview for the course, um, we're going to really kind of stick to uh, single tables, um, no inner join kind of stuff, and we're going to really focus our attention on um, what it means to kind of synchronize uh, identifiers from the client to the server and then back again. So. Um, in order to um, get all of that kind of stuff situated, um, I have gone ahead and I've created tables um, for my classes, for all my courses, and for my semesters. Um, and we, uh, I use the exact same process as we used for creating um, the classes, I either the semesters table in the previous video. Uh, I just did that for classes and for, for courses. Um, and then I did another database sync. Um, so if I go to my database, um, I will see that I have um, all three of those uh, tables, and I have uh, pre-populated some data into courses. Um, so I'm going to kind of explain uh, what each of these things means in relationship to one another, and then that's going to drive our, um, our kind of uh, explanation of how the app kind of works. So um, semesters are uh, fairly obvious. It's sort of uh, fall 2019, spring 2020, whatever. Um, it has a name, it has a modified date, and it has an order number, um, which I'm not even using anymore, um, but you could modify my code to use it if you'd like. Um, I have courses, um, and courses are basically a, what's called a lookup table. So courses give you um, content about the course itself, and then classes are specific instances of that course. Um, so we have here CN4020, so our engineering class. Um, we have theory of computation and C-sharp. These are the three um, classes that I uh, teach the most frequently. Um, so these um, I pre-populated um, because I haven't built into the application a way to add courses. You, of course, could do that if you'd like. Um, but I needed uh, something in here because uh, I also wanted to show you what it looks like to kind of try to bind um, identifiers to entities, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So down here, um, I have a class. Um, and this class um, is really the crux of the whole thing. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to add classes to my list. And I want that class to have some data of its own. So that is the instructor, um, the syllabus, which we'll talk about in, a, in an auxiliary um, video about how to upload um, actual files. Um, I have a Canvas link, uh, which we could also um, do some work in with the uh, Canvas API if we have time. And we also have enrollment. Um, so right now, the kind of uh, simplest metadata that we're showing in the app is the instructor, which is just a string, and uh, the enrollment, which is an integer. In addition to that, what I have is I have these links, uh, course ID and semester ID. 
And the idea um, is I have set this database up so that I don't have to store the course code and the course name 5,000 times for 5,000 uh, 5, different classes. Um, I can store it only once, and then I can reference that particular row um, with the uh, appropriate ID for a class. So if I have 100 software engineering classes, I only have one reference to the software engineering course code and course name, and potentially a whole lot of other data about the course. Um, and I can just reference um, it, that uh, record in the course table rather than copying the data um, every line. So every class would have the exact same duplicated data. Um, this is called uh, increasing database normalization, um, and uh, there's like whole schools of thought around how normalized the database should be. Um, but this is kind of an example of uh, a very common kind of use case that you'll see um, not only in database architecture, um, but also uh, things that you have to frequently model inside of the data framework. So. Um, not only do I have a course link, I also have a semester link um, because obviously each of these classes is going to link to exactly one course and exactly one semester. Um, and I also don't want to store duplicative information about the semester. Um, so uh, that uh, kind of follows the same pattern. So all of this um, is inside of a SQL database called avet uh, underscore db. It's running on my local machine. Um, these are relational data, uh, database tables. Um, they have uh, only the structure that you see. Um, and so uh, previously what we talked about is we can use SQL client. Um, so we can uh, use execute reader uh, to go in here and uh, pull uh, records out. We could also use uh, execute non-query to insert uh, rows with store procedures. But the primary kind of downfall to that um, is these IDs. Um, so we said that it's non-trivial um, to support uh, returning IDs in a meaningful way for a multi-threaded environment where potentially I am using the environment and you are using the environment and our 5,000 friends are using the environment. Um, how do we know um, what ID is going to be given um, to any particular row as it's inserted uh, because we don't actually have access to that ID until the row exists um, because we're using identity. So uh, one of the ways that we can fix this situation um, is by using what is called Entity Framework. So um, a, a small note about Entity Framework, um, it's basically um, Microsoft's version of what's called an object relational uh, mapping system uh, or engine. And so what it does is it takes um, a relational structure like these tables and it maps it into an object related uh, or an object based structure um, like a class um, inside of managed code. So uh, what do I have here? Uh, I have a uh, class that is called semester. Um, and I have uh, decorated this uh, semester with an annotation in C sharp. Uh, it's very similar to the ones that we use for routing prefix and for the route um, in the API controller. Um, but here what I'm doing is I am actually tying this object to a specific table. Um, so here I'm saying this class will uh, go to dbo.semester um, and it is going to read all of the stuff out of the semesters table. And right now I have nothing. So what I can do um, is I can specify um, which uh, table of which columns I want to take out of that table by specifying an appropriate property. So it has to be a property, it can't be a field. And the, uh, the name of the property has to match um, a column. So I have an ID, I have a name, and I have a last modified. Um, and this matches uh, ID, name, and last modified. I do not necessarily have to have order number, for example. Um, and I need to specify the key on whatever primary key is on the table. So this um, is the crux of our um, IED synchronization kind of concept. Um, if you have structures that are in your relational database and they don't have primary keys, it is going to be virtually impossible for you to reasonably perform CRUD um, across multiple layers. Um, the reason is because you're going to have to either assign an ID on the client side or the server side in order to ensure that you're not essentially 
uh, keeping a SQL heap and not a table. You're not just throwing a bunch of uh, rows that could be completely duplicative into the database. Um, so if you choose, like we were talking about last time, to uh, generate the IDs on the client side, um, then potentially um, you have a whole bunch of distributed IDs that are being granted um, all over the place. And so I could get an ID and somebody in Europe could get an ID and somebody in Australia could all get the same IDs. And when it went to the database, um, the inserts would fail. And the reason the inserts would fail is because the primary key constraint would be violated. So trying to synchronize things on the client side doesn't make a lot of sense. However, um, all of the distributed clients are talking to the same database through the same services. And so it makes a lot of sense to allocate IDs in the database. And the identity column allows us to naturally just kind of do that. This key attribute, uh, what's going to happen is when we look at the add or update and the delete um, or remove uh, methods inside of uh, Entity Framework, it is actually going to uh, return to us by side effect um, what ID was granted to a new uh, entity. Um, and it is also going to be able to find an existing entity using that same ID that was originally given to it by the server, even if the client has uh, got hold of that entity 10 years or 15 years after it was created. Um, so basically the ground truth or the, the central store of IDs is the database that is shared by all of the client machines and we're going to perform ID synchronization uh, through Entity Framework because Entity Framework makes it really easy. It does it all for you. So um, I have this is a new thing, this key thing is a new thing. Um, and you kind of, um, you have to have matching names, you have to have matching types, but the types kind of make sense. So int maps to int, uh, string maps to any uh, var car or car or in var car. Um, you can actually restrict the length of this, but it's sort of irrelevant. Um, you're going to only get the maximum size of the string um, in the database anyway. Um, date time maps to date time in SQL. Um, var binary maps to byte stream uh, in C sharp. Uh, so on and so forth. So um, the types make a lot of sense. The names should be exactly the same. Um, so these classes, um, they have nothing special about them except for the decoration um, for the table and the key. Let's say that you didn't want um, to have a matching name. You could also specify a column. Uh, so you could add a column decorator to any, any of these uh, properties. Um, and you could actually map a differently named property to a column of whatever name you wanted. Um, however, um, I kind of think that that's bad practice because then you have to keep in your mind uh, this kind of artificial mapping between what's going on in the classes and memory and what's happening in the tables. And that's not necessarily a great situation to be in. So um, this um, is the semester. Uh, we can look at course, exactly the same thing is happening here. Um, we can look at the class exactly the same thing is happening here. Um, and this is the byte array. Um, if you look at um, the syllabus table um, over here in class, um, I have set syllabus to var binary max. What this means is instead of storing um, strings that are human readable, um, this is actually going to store a byte string uh, as a 60 as a base 64 string um, and you're going to be able to read it back out of the database um, natively um, using entity framework and get a byte uh, array. Uh, and so this is how you can actually store whole files or whatever you want to in the database um, without a whole bunch of additional uh, functionality from the SQL side. So one thing to note um, is that in the semester um, I'm using dbo dot blah. Um, remember that DBO um, is the default schema and in uh, databases the schema is basically just a collection of things you can dump store procedures or views or tables or whatever into it. Um, so as long as you're in DBO you don't actually have to have DBO and so over here in course and class I have um, not uh, put uh, the DBO in front of it and it does exactly the same thing. Um, there's, there's no difference there. So. Now, um, the question is, how um, do I link these entities um, or these uh, classes to uh, my actual database? And so if you look um, under persistence, 
the uh, amount of complexity um, that we have in, uh, implemented in the persistence folder um, has increased quite a bit. So uh, in here, you will see we used to have this DB mock thing. This DB mock um, is uh, really just a, a static class that holds uh, information in memory until the server restarts. Um, now we also have this thing called ABET context. ABET context is going to take the place of DB mock. So what is this thing? Uh, ABET context um, is the actual map um, that sits on top of the database and uh, does all of the relational mapping. Um, so this thing is um, a derived class from DB context. DB context is the central part of the entity framework uh, library. And so all you need to do um, is derive from DB context a context of whatever name you want. And this is how you invoke um, the base or the parent classes constructor. So what's happening here um, is the parent constructor takes in um, a single uh, parameter and you can see here um, it is a uh, connection string or it is the name of a connection string. So um, what I've done is I have hard-coded my connection string. I could have just as easily put a connection string in the web.config file and then referenced the name of that uh, connection string in this uh, string right here and done the exact same thing. So this base call is going to go off and it is going to tell ABIT context the database that it is actually bound to. Um, and then uh, this is just sort of default kind of uh, boilerplate stuff to make the configuration uh, work. So um, what happens um, is when this gets invoked, um, it will go off and it will understand all of the tables and all of the columns and all of those tables for the database that is pointed to by this connection string. So let's talk a little bit about security in this connection string. So what I am doing right here is I am using trusted connection equals true. Um, so if you are familiar with databases uh, in a Windows context, what trusted connection equals true means is that my SQL server is set up to take um, my Windows credential. So this is actually my user on my local machine. Um, and uh, it is set up to um, trust my passed through credential. And so what will happen is I can um, connect to that server without a password. So I don't have to type a plain text password. I don't have to have a user, whatever. In order for a person to exploit this uh, connection string, they would have to have my access to my machine with my username and my password. Um, which is very unlikely to happen. Um, if you wanted to supply a user and a password at the SQL level, so um, if you're actually in SQL and you're going to create some logins, um, which is sort of best practice for a production environment, um, what you would want to do is you would want to supply a username and a password, um, but you obviously would not want to put it in the connection string in uh, this method call. And the reason is because there are tools that will allow you to decompile this DLL. And uh, what will happen is a person can decompile this DLL, this string literal will be in the decompiled code, and then they will have the uh, username and the password and all the connection information to the database. And so now what can happen is that person can go off, connect to the database, get whatever data out of it they want, um, and run away with it, um, which is not necessarily a great situation. So in the event that you're using a username and a password, what you really want to do is you want to store that thing in the web config. Ideally, you would store it in the web config and then you would encrypt it. Um, however, even if you don't encrypt it, what's going to happen is this web config file is going to get deployed to the web server. Um, and that web server is it going to have its own uh, security put, put on top of it. Um, you can't just sort of like go in and gain access to a web server. You're going to have to have some sort of Windows credentials in order to log in. Um, you're going to have to have access to IIS in order to actually see the web config file. Um, so there are all of these hurdles that a person would actually have to jump through in order to gain access to the web config file, even if there's a plain text password in it. Um, so again, the difference is I am not using a password. I am using a Windows uh, token. It's extremely difficult to spoof. 
Um, so I can use just the connection string here. If you're using username and password, you want to make sure that either it is in a web config file that's somewhere secure, or it is somewhere secure and it's encrypted so that you're not giving uh, random people access to your database. So um, outside of that, um, what we have is we have a uh, public property that is a virtual property of type database set or DB set of each type um, of model that we have. So um, previously we've talked about uh, model view controller and MVVM, which is uh, model view model uh, view or model view model M V V M model view view model. That's it. It's late. Um, and so these are literally model classes. Um, so now what we're doing is we're serving those model classes as part of a DB set. What this is going to do is it's going to grant you access to all of the rows in a specific table. And now you're going to be able to use all of the link stuff that we talked about two weeks ago on each of these sets. Um, so you could go to the semesters list and you could gain uh, access to all the semesters ordered by whatever and filtered by whatever where clause you want. Um, and you never actually have to issue any SQL uh, yourself. Um, it's all um, baked in C sharp. And the only SQL that you ever had to write um, was uh, the SQL to actually create the tables. And in order to do that, you could have just as easily used the WYSIWYG designer and then did the schema um, synchronization that we uh, showed last time. Um, and so you have to know very, very, very little actual SQL in order to get this thing to work, um, which is ideal if you're working in a small company and you don't necessarily have access to a DBA um, and everybody's trying to play DBA on TV. Um, this is a much safer way of doing things because um, all of this sort of framework is optimized in ways that uh, you as a uh, software engineer wouldn't necessarily be trained to optimize queries or store procedures, so on and so forth. So um, this is now uh, taking place of um, all of the DV mock stuff. And what does that mean? That means when I run the actual application, I have nothing because my tables have nothing in them. <coughs> but if I add a new fall 2018, and I go over here, and I select, now I've got a fall 2019. Um, and I can click this thing, I can add classes, and now I have a class lookup, and this lookup is pointed to my lookup table. Um, and so I can choose theory, for example. Um, I can be um, Bob Ross, can be the instructor. The enrollment can be 900 people, for all I know. Uh, I can hit OK. And now I have a class. And so if I go back to my database and I do my selects again, now I have a class. And so I have the instructor, I have the enrollment, I have the semester ID, which links back to 28, which is my fall 2019 semester. Um, I have the course uh, ID, which links back to theory of computation. Um, and now if I refresh, this thing lives for forever. It lives for as long as I don't delete um, the rows in the database or lose the database or God knows what happens to the database. So, um, this is kind of the logical extreme um, of persistence. Um, now I have uh, kind of everything working as one would expect to work um, on a modern website. Um, I have the ability to interact with a simple UI um, and I can add stuff and I can remove stuff. Um, and when I refresh, um, it doesn't magically come back and it doesn't magically go away. Um, so that's all kind of well and good. So. Um, what I'm going to do now um, is go through um, each of the uh, kind of major CRUD operations, so addition uh, or insert and delete um, for a semester and for a class, and then take a look at end-to-end, uh, -end. so what is happening in JavaScript all the way to what is happening in the EC layer, um, and then uh, I think that will give you kind of overall uh, picture of how all of this stuff kind of, kind of hangs together. So 
Um, if you go to Solution Explorer and you go to app.js, um, let's look at adding a semester first. So here um, is my add a semester. And so if I want to add a semester, I can just say this is going to be um, fall 2020. Hit OK. And so now in my Visual Studio, um, I'm on this uh, post request. And so the post request itself is largely unchanged from last time, right? We've seen um, all of this HTTP traffic from client over to server and back. Um, but now when we go um, into this API call, which exists over here in Solution Explorer, in Semester Controller, Add or Update, so when I hit continue, it's going to come here. Um, and so again, my semester has been uh, magically parsed uh, to be fall 2020 um, from the body of the HTTP request. So previously, it was just a, a blob of JSON. And now Web API has actually taken the job with the blob of JSON and made it a strongly typed class. Uh, we noticed that this is a brand new semester. So my ID is currently 0, uh, which totally makes sense. It's unallocated. And so now, if I go uh, one layer deeper, I'm going from the, uh, the API controller, which is in charge of communication, down into the EC layer, F11, uh, which is responsible for business logic. Uh, so now what I'm doing um, is something that seems ridiculous. Now I'm taking the semester DTO, I'm making a new semester object out of it, um, and I'm copying over this ID. Um, and I will, sh I will show you why. Um, this ID is currently set to be zero because this semester DTO is brand new. Uh, this is being added. If this thing was being updated, um, which is something um, that you should try to implement on your own time, um, this ID would not be zero. It would be 78, it would be 14, who knows what it would be. And by passing that correct ID to add or update, down here, instead of adding a new semester, what would actually happen um, is it would update um, the semester with ID 14 or 84 or 72 or whatever um, to the metadata that's associated with this entity that I just created. Um, so the difference between adding and updating is that adding the ID is zero and updating it is not zero. Um, there are cases when that's not true. Um, but largely those are uh, for extremely distributed uh, systems with a very large amount of offline support and cl the client side of things. Um, and we might be able to talk about that later in the semester. Um, but suffice it to say, um, if the ID is zero or negative, it's going to be a new thing. If it's a positive integer, it's going to be an old thing. And that's how add or update knows what, whether it's going to be an add or an update. So after we add our update, um, we call the save changes async method. What this is doing is this is actually creating an object and then associating it with the database set. That doesn't do anything to the database. Um, the database doesn't actually uh, change until this save changes async call is made. When this is made, what happens is everything in this list um, of uh, objects is then synchronized down to the database as relational objects, and then we get a callback. And that callback um, goes into each of these things, and now you'll see my new semester, my ID used to be uh, zero, and now my new semester's ID is 29. So by calling save changes async, um, that triggers a side effect, uh, which is sort of unfortunate from a, a learning perspective. Um, that changes or updates this new semester's ID. So down here, what I'm doing is I'm reconstituting a brand new semester uh, DTO that has the appropriate ID. So now what's going to happen is if we go into app.js and I go into this dude right here, my um, semester comes over with the appropriate ID. And that's important because now if I click on this thing and I start associating uh, classes, um, I'm going to want that class to have the appropriate semester ID 
so that I can uh, associate the class with the appropriate semester. Kind of makes sense. So if we uh, delete all of these breakpoints and we go to adding a class, adding a class right here. Okay. So now what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to add a new class for theory. Um, Bob Ross is going to be the name of the guy. It's going to have 900 people in it. I'm going to hit OK. And so now what's going to happen um, is, again, this is largely untouched. Um, I think that I, I made there, I, I fixed some inconsistencies in uh, case and stuff like that. Um, but um, largely, Um, it's just going to kind of do the same thing. So if I go to my class controller and the add or update over here. Now my class DCO um, has an ID of zero. Um, that ID is zero because this is a brand new class. Um, it has my course ID, uh, course ID, it has my enrollment, it has my semester ID, and it has my instructor. Um, all of that stuff, again, comes from Magic, um, uh, brought to you by Web API. And so now, again, we're going to go from the communication layer, which is the Web API controller, um, down into the EC, which is the uh, business uh, logic kind of layer. Um, and we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to take uh, class DTO, we're going to copy class DTO's ID um, into the ID of the new class. We're going to add the class to my list of classes. Um, if you see um, C here, has an ID of zero. If I step over, save changes async, now C has an ID of four. Um, and so I'm going to reconstitute a DTO that has the appropriate ID. I'm going to go back to here. And when it comes back from the server to the client, I'm going to look in uh, data and my object does in fact have an ID of four and now everything is kind of cool. And so what that means is I can go through the process of updating the UI um, where I'm just adding to my course list that, that is associated with the semester that I've selected. Um, I'm going to push it into that list and then I jump out and everything's happy. So I've got my, um, my class here. So I did notice a bug uh, that I want to talk about really briefly and that's this. Um, so notice here, this is a lowercase id and this is an uppercase id. This made me a little bit dubious. Um, and if we go to Solution Explorer and we look at index.html and we look at um, the selected class, Um, that um, ID, if you dig through um, some of this stuff, um, this should almost certainly be an uppercase ID um, because ultimately you're going to be able to select a class that exists server side um, and that ID is going to be capitalized in the C-sharp um, model. Um, so when it comes across, it's going to be deserialized as a capital I ID. Um, so that's, um, I'll, I'll try to fix that in the, uh, the code that I upload to Canvas. Um, so beyond that, um, that kind of works and does everything that you would expect it to do, right? Um, so we have fall, we have this uh, COT, I can add a new semester, so uh, spring uh, 2021, for example, add that thing, and now if I click on spring 2021, Clearly, I don't have the class because I just added this thing. If I click on fall 2020, I do have the class um, and everything is great. So now <clears throat> the question is, how do I get rid of um, rid of things? Um, so add or update really is about the ID. Um, ID being zero means it's new. ID being not zero means it is not new. It's going to be an update. 
um, uh, remove actually works on the entity itself, um, but we are going to expose a way of doing of dealing with re uh, removal uh, using ID uh, because we don't necessarily want to send our entire DTO over the wire um, just to remove uh, something from the database. So we're going to start um, with classes, kind of working our, our way backward. Um, so if we go to our code and we go to uh, delete. I'm going to set a breakpoint on remove class. So come back over here and we're going to hit remove class. Now, what I have here um, is I have a get method, so I have no body uh, in my HTTP request. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to send the ID um, over the uh, URL. In general, um, this is not a great idea um, because what could happen is somebody could generate a whole bunch of uh, curl calls um, to uh, our curl requests with random numbers and essentially remove a whole bunch of random stuff out of your database. <clears throat> it's much harder. Um, if you uh, make it a post method and have to generate some uh, JSON, uh, and you can uh, test uh, the JSON or acquire um, something in the post uh, in order to secure things. Um, you can also do authentication um, on the uh, server side, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, this is kind of the easiest uh, way um, to get rid of um, something in the database. Uh, passing the minimum amount of data over the wire. And so here I'm not necessarily prioritizing security, I'm prioritizing speed. Um, so this is uh, one way that you could do it. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put a breakpoint there. <clears throat> and what's gonna happen is we're gonna go to the class controller, we're gonna look for um, a git method um, called class slash remove. Um, so over here, um, we have a remove slash ID, so it should come to this guy. Um, if I hit continue, it lo and behold does come to this guy. Um, if you remember, we had ID four, so now it's passing ID four back to me. Um, this is only possible uh, because um, it uh, was given the ID when it was retrieved from the server. <clears throat> um, so the bug that I was just talking about would actually really only matter if you were updating. Um, it doesn't affect adding or removing. Um, so it's kind of irrelevant for my purposes, but you would need to fix it if you were trying to do um, update. And so um, here, what we're gonna do is again, um, go from the communication layer, that is the uh, API controller, um, down into the EC, or the enterprise controller, which is as the, the business logic. And here, um, you have an example um, of how you can use link um, to do uh, your bidding uh, without writing a bunch of SQL um, and issuing a query. So if you remember um, the remove and the uh, add or update and all of that um, in the last video we're using SQL client, um, that was obviously much, much, much more complicated. Um, here, what we're doing is we're going to classes. We are getting the first class that has this matching ID. Um, we can be fairly certain that there's only one of them to begin with because this ID is marked as a key um, on the uh, model. So we're gonna get one back I remember we wouldn't necessarily want to use first in case this thing has already been removed by uh, maybe somebody that you've never even met before. And so you would come in to remove it a second time and instead of just doing nothing, um, it would actually crash. That's not super great. Um, so we're using first or default, which won't crash. And uh, what we're doing then is we're passing that entity to the remove method on the classes DB set. And then we're again um, calling the save changes async. So um, a, a minor note about the async await pattern. So async await requires the return type to be wrapped in this task uh, type. Uh, so it returns a generic uh, task. Um, what that means um, is you kind of want to pass back some data, even in cases like this where the data maybe doesn't make a ton of sense. So, what we're doing here is we are returning a class DTO um, that is made of the ID. Uh, we could just as easily just pass the ID back. Um, the idea here, um, this would be uh, for uh, 
checking to make sure that you're deleting the correct thing and resaving it if it's not the correct thing. Um, you could implement something like undelete uh, with something like this, so on and so forth. Um, but it, from a kind of high level, it doesn't make a ton of sense to want uh, to return something in remove. And if you don't want to do that, you could always just return a task that doesn't have anything inside of it. Um, if you do that, um, then you have to do some kind of funny, funny business in the uh, controller, so in the task controller, to make this work. Um, because what's happening right here um, is it is returning um, an IHTTP action result um, that is generic itself. So you actually have to give this thing the ability to return a typeless um, response. Um, which is more trouble than it's really worth. Um, and the idea really behind async await um, is that you should have a response from the asynchronous method to make sure that the asynchronous method actually did what it was supposed to do to begin with, um, or you can actually use the data that the asynchronous method was computing. So um, most of the time, uh, you will see this sort of gratuitous um, uh, data return. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to return all of it. And I am, in this case, uh, if you wanted to um, minimize data on the return from the server back to the client side, um, you could obviously just um, return the ID, or you could return empty OK. Uh, you could do really whatever you wanted to do. So if I go um, back to um, app.js, I hit continue. Um, now my response, I have um, some data, and that data looks a lot like the class that I just deleted. Um, however, I don't actually use that response at all. What I do is I use the ID. So um, what this stuff is doing is, is updating the UI. Um, right here, it is going to find the, or very naively find the index um, that I need to get rid of in my list. Uh, so it will go through all of that. Next, it's going to actually remove the item from the list, which is removed. And then it determines if um, I just removed um, the uh, selected class, uh, which in this case I did. And what it's doing is it is setting selected class to undefined um, so that when I hit continue, everything goes away. Um, so if I didn't do this part, this part, um, I would have um, nothing um, here, but I would have stuff over here, um, and it just wouldn't make a ton of sense. So uh, we can look at the uh, core or the semester controller um, here. We're going to look and do exactly the same thing. Um, I've shown you that you can na name it really whatever you want. Um, if I go to debug and I delete all the breakpoints. I can go to this thing. Um, I can go to this thing. And I can start deleting these. And so um, here, again, I'm passing 30. Um, and if I go to my database, uh, 30 is going to be my new semester that I just added. Um, and if I look, spring 2021 is the thing I'm trying to delete, which totally makes sense. Um, and so in here, I'm going to go from the communication layer back to the business logic layer. Um, and here, I'm doing the exact same pattern. I'm finding the entity I want to remove using first or default. I remove it. I save the changes. And then I return the to remove uh, entity back. Uh, so here, I'm, I'm actually returning a model. I'm not returning a DTO. You can do either one. It doesn't actually really matter. And now I'm going to come back to app.js. Um, if I look at uh, remove semester, um, here I'm also doing exactly the same stuff. Um, so if I continue, um, I have removed uh, the response because I'm not actually going to use it. Um, if I go forward, uh, I've removed things. And then um, this last catch here doesn't actually matter. Um, until I uh, remove everything. And so if I remove everything, continue, continue, uh, I only have the one addition uh, button. If you don't have the selected, um, the selected semester removal in the callback, 
um, what will happen is you will always have two. You'll have one for semesters and one for classes, but it doesn't make sense to have an uh, addition of classes for no selected uh, semester. It kind of just doesn't make sense. So um, that is the long and short, uh, primarily the long um, of entity framework. Um, how it works, how you set it up, what it means to be uh, connected to a database, uh, how you model tables, um, and a, a sort of full walkthrough um, of the JavaScript on the client side, all the way to the SQL database on the server side, um, potentially going through a web server to a database server, um, and all of that in between. Um, so uh, thank you for watching, um, and in the next video we're going to do is we're going to tackle MongoDB, um, which is essentially um, a, a mechanism for skipping relational tables entirely um, and storing everything as essentially a JSON blob. And so we've seen a lot about JSON blobs, and we'll continue to use um, kind of the same logic in order to get from JSON blob to objects um, and bypass uh, the structure of a relational database to begin with. So thanks very much, and I will see you in the next video.